welcome everyone to the Craft and Farm Business Startup webinar, training session, live show, whatever you want to call it. Um, it is Wednesday and on April, what is it, 21st, right? And it is snowing um, almost everywhere. So what an apt day for the Craft and Farm Business Startup. Um, I really uh, want to thank everybody for joining us, and I hope that you will consider using our services. If you're thinking about starting a business, um, you can always reach us. We are um, covering Watertown, Jefferson, and Oswego counties, but anywhere in the state of New York, we have an SBDC. We have 22 regional offices. So here we go. Now, you've decided you want to get started in the craft or farm market business, and we are here to introduce our experts to you. First, I want to welcome Kylie Peck, who is the um, director of the Watertown Farm and Craft Market and the president and CEO of the Greater Watertown North Country Chamber of Commerce. And um, Kylie leads the organization that's been responsible for the Watertown Craft and Farm Market for over 40 years. So she is, knows a lot about organized markets. Um, and then Eric Kina from the Cornell Cooperative Extension Service, who uh, is uh, a graduate of SUNY Cobalt Skill and is uh, in our Mexico office. So we have um, Oswego County in the house and Chris Moy Bush, who's the owner of Bush Gardens. And that's in Lewis County. So we have all three counties represented. We're, you know, we're making sure we, we uh, honor everybody. And Chris is gonna, going to talk about her real life experiences in the farm market I'm sorry, in having a farm stand at her home and farm and doing the craft and farm market business. So um, Kylie is uh, traveling and she's on the road today. So she's joining us bravely, I might add, from her phone. Um, and we really appreciate all of you taking the time out to be with us today and to t teach our folks about farm and craft markets and how they can become better at what they do. Okay, so thoughts and ideas from our panelists. Here we go. This is the guts of the presentation. Where do I find information and regulations on regulations for food processing and packaging? Much of that information, if not all of it, is going to be found on the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets websites, which uh, we have some links, and I'd be more than happy to drop that in the chat. Um, and more accessible versions of that information can be found on the New York uh, or the the Farmers Market Federation of New York website. Um, and we'll, we'll go into a little bit about this here so that you, know, you get an idea before you even have to tr track down some more in-depth information. But in terms of um, processing and packaging, from what I understand uh, on this, there's a really nice um, checklist that covers permits, licenses, and certificates, and does mention um, laws or regulations regarding uh, processing and packaging. Um, and on this document, you, uh, you'll you find that uh, food processing is not allowed to occur at farmer's markets. And Kylie can correct me if, I'm, if that's wrong. Um, and there are some special things you, you need to, you know, adhere to if you're doing home processing. Um, you might need to be um, registered as a home processor, depending on what you're processing. And, um, and Kylie can probably go into a little bit more detail on that. Um, but right now I can say that uh, you know, if you are, um, if you're a home processor, you know, doing non-hazardous foods only, um, which include jams, uh, jellies, uh, candy that, ex excluding chocolate, it can include um, candy and spices and herbs for repackaging only, you're exempt from from the uh, Article 20C license. Um, and it's a little, uh, you might also have to adhere to uh, the food labeling law, whether you're exempt or not. Um, if, you had to, if you have to adhere to the New York State food labeling law, on your food labels, you'd have to include um, information about the name of your business, or if it's, uh, you know, if it's a different manufacturer, you need to include that information, uh, your place of business, uh, ingredient declaration in order of, um, of predominance by weight. And you need to include the net quantity of the contents in the package. Um, and like I said, a lot more of that information can be found on some websites. I'll drop those links in after I'm, I'm done talking. If anybody 
if any of the other panelists would like to elaborate on that. Okay, thanks. So sure. if I'm understanding correctly, if I'm making spice packets to mix with yogurt or sour cream at my home, for example, I can do that in my kitchen without a license or any regulation from New York State. Um, same thing with jams and jellies and candy without chocolate, which to me, is that really candy? I mean, that's right. personal preference. <laughs> um, but, uh, but one interesting thing, and I'm going to ask Kylie to kind of talk, talk, to talk next, but when you said um, people can't make items at the market. So that's very, that, that's um, one of the things that Kylie's going to talk about is the difference between a sort of informal farmer's market and a formal farmer's market that has, has articles of incorporation, if, if you will, and a lot of regulation. And that, that one of those is the Watertown Farm and Craft Market. So Kylie, would you talk a little bit about um, the regulations um, and what happens at the markets and what people are and are not allowed to do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think Eric started off by referencing a really great uh, source, which is the New York State Farmers Market Federation. We get all of our guidance uh, through them. Uh, we work with them closely every year to make sure there's any changes if they are needed. Um, so if you are starting out, that's a really great place, um, you know, to get started. But for the Watertown Farm and Craft Market, uh, we have pretty detailed requirements that we put out to all of our potential vendors. Um, and requiring all of the appropriate state licensing um, is certainly uh, necessary to participate in our market. Now, not all of uh, the markets throughout the region are as strict or organized um, as ours are. Uh, ours just happens to be, we've been running for 40 plus years and uh, we've, had, we've, we've kind of really figured out um, the right mix of things and how that works. And one thing that I do wanna to mention too, um, I don't know uh, those that are on the call, but something worth mentioning specifically about labeling and packaging. If you're doing any meat products, you have to make sure you're following USDA guidelines as well. Uh, so they have specific packaging requirements um, if you are bringing meat products to the market too. So just something in case someone's watching after the fact that does um, fall under that category, that's something that uh, we require at our farm and craft market. Um, but there are a lot of uh, requirements and licensing uh, in order to serve products to uh, the general public and it's really for their safety and your own. Um, so if you're processing foods in your in your home kitchen, we want to make sure that's being inspected by New York State Health um, for obvious reasons. We don't want uh, any unsanitary situations in, in serving foods to our our market goers in the in the general public um, in that area. But like I said, uh, when you're looking at a specific market, make sure you're reading their guidance because they may not all be the same. Uh, our market puts out very detailed, it's about 20 pages or so of um, the requirements, which we do follow the lead on the Farmers Market Federation for those. Okay, and it's, Absolutely. It, you know, your, your market is huge. I've been to it. Um, even last year when it was scaled down, it was still huge. Um, and many of the smaller markets don't have the same number of vendors. Uh, but I think it's really, so So to Kylie's point, it's very, it's useful for you to understand that as a potential attendee, what markets you're thinking about joining and if they are like Watertown and have a lot of, um, you know, and are officially incorporated and have rules and regulations, they'll be happy to email you all of those because all the markets want vendors and they want a variety of vendors. So um, that's great. And what else, I wanted to say one other thing about that. Um, Oh, when you mentioned about home kitchens. And so, yes, you can have your home kitchen certified. And if uh, you're interested in doing that, you can contact the SBDC. We can help you with that. Um, or you can go to a test kitchen. And there, and there are ones all over. There's St. Lawrence County has one in Governor. There's one in Sacramento Harbor. Um, and there's another one that I can't think of. But there are places where you can go and rent those kitchens and make products that that are then legal to sell at the market. So there's there's a couple options and not all of them involve spending a lot of money at your home to renovate a kitchen. Sure. I do have a, one other thing to mention too. Um, you know, sure. this question focuses more on the food processing and packaging side of things, but 
if you're selling, um, we'll cover the, the, the um, requirements for permits and licenses uh, in a moment. But um, if you're selling fresh produce, there's no requirement for a license. But of course, the same thing, like kind of to piggyback off of what Kylie was saying, you, you have to make sure you're following the, the laws regarding your food product anyway. So if you're doing fresh produce, you have to abide by the produce safety rule of the Food Modernization Act. If you're doing uh, meat, uh, whether you're processing it or not, you still have to follow the uh, laws regarding those. Okay. And um, Chris, when we, when we did our practice run on Friday, you were talking about um, how you handle lettuce, for example. And I found that so interesting. And maybe this is a good place for you to kind of talk about that. You're, you know, you're our, our person on the ground doing this job um, of selling at farmer's markets and at your, own, at your own craft stand. So what are some of the best practices for food packaging and handling that you employ with your fresh produce? So we usually um, wash all of our produce just before we bring it to market. We try to keep it a minimum on people touching it so that that way, for instance, we're set up right in front of the state office building. A lot of people come out and get things for salads. They don't have to worry about rewashing. They don't have to worry about how many people have touched it before they touched it. Um, even though COVID put a damper on things last year, in that case, it actually helped us out. It, it helped the consumers because you are the only person touching it besides us. And when we're at market, we do use a um, gloves when we package our lettuce. Okay, payment. This is one of everybody's favorite topics. And Chris, as long as we're talking to you, maybe you would start off and talk about your experience with payment at the farmer's markets um, or the festivals that, that you sell at and, and at sure. your own farm stand. Yep. So our farm stand is a self-serve. We uh, work off the honor system. We do have our phone numbers all over our farm stand though. So if someone needs to, uh, needs our assistance or is paying with anything other than cash, we accept credit cards. Um, we also use Facebook pay and also uh, Venmo. We're looking into some other forms of payment as well. I just have to figure it out. Like there's the Samsung pay as well. Uh, we just try to make it as easy as possible. At the market, we accept the tokens for EBT and you can get those tokens from the Chamber of Commerce. So uh, farmer's market coupons, uh, we accept those as well. We try to make it diverse so anybody can come in there and use any form of payment. Well, that's great advice because in our, in our uh, ever becoming ever more cashless society, really, we have to offer consumers all the options. Um, right. Kylie, would you talk a little bit about, um, you know, some the, your experience at the farmers, managing the farmer's market and the payment issue? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that uh, Chris has it right. You know, the more options you can provide to the, your customers, the more likely you are to get a sale. Um, I have seen a, a big switch over to our vendors using an individual system themselves. So they're accepting card payments. The Facebook pay thing is new to me. So I, I, I expect that that's going to continue to, um, you know, to become more popular. But one thing that we have provided for many years is a token program. Um, you can use your SNAP and EBT to obtain tokens at the Chamber of Commerce booth and uh, they come out in, in dollar increments and you can use those at specific uh, vendors that are enrolled in the FMNP or the Farmer's Market Nutrition Program booth um, for fresh fruits and vegetables, um, even our, uh, you know, our cheese filled uh, pepperoni uh, stand accepts those tokens as well. Um, so as long as it's food that is intended to be consumed off site, you can use those tokens. So you can't use them at um, a food truck, for instance, but if you want to buy fresh produce um, and stock up for the week, it's a really, really great option that we offer. And that way you don't have to go get cash out. You can just come to us directly and get the tokens and use those at the appropriate vendors. Okay, 
and we actually have a question about payment. Um, and Chris, I'm going to ask you and Kylie to both answer to both um, answer this. Yes, not ask it. Joan asked the question, um, and she asked, "Does anyone have experience with Square? And do I need a backup battery to make it through a seven-hour day at the market?" So I do use Square at the market. I also use it here at at the home stand. I've never had to have a backup battery, but I do bring um, some form of, well, we have electricity actually at the market. So we plug it in if we need it, but it does, it lasts a while. So you should be fine. We use it through our phone. There's a little adapter that goes on the phone and we use it that way. Kylie, do you have any thoughts? Uh, nothing much more to add. Uh, Chris did touch on at our market specifically, we do have electricity available to our vendors. Um, you would just check that on your application that you do need access to that. Um, I have used Square um, in a number of other situations, not at the market uh, for hours. Um, and I have not required an additional backup, but it can never hurt to bring one with you. Nowadays, they have those charger packs that are so handy. Um, I keep them in my car. So they're always handy to make sure you can charge your phone um, that you're using for that system. Yeah, they, they sure are. And, and to your point, many of them, and I think this is true of most of the markets I can think of, do have electricity. And, you know, so if you wanted that at your booth, or if you needed to charge up for 15 or 20 minutes, you know, um, just check, check with a neighbor. I'm sure that uh, in the spirit of, you know, collegiality, everyone would be happy to do that. Okay. Yeah, I'll just add, uh, so for, we have our, our token system, so we have to swipe cards and all that stuff. Every night, or every Tuesday night, we make sure all of our items are charged fully, um, so we're ready to deploy first thing in the morning. Uh, just a kind of a best practice to get into, make that part of your routine when you're preparing for the market. And what time does your market open, Kylie? Uh, we start at 7 a.m. Okay, so yeah, so it's best to make sure they're charged up the night before. No running around the house yeah. charging them in the morning. Okay, makes makes perfect sense. Okay, how about sales tax? Who wants to take the sales tax question? Kylie, you want to start off with that one? Sure, absolutely. That's no problem at all. So our market, uh, again, the Watertown Farm and Craft Market, does require New York State sales tax certificate in order to be accepted into the market. There may be some where, um, you know, if you're making a craft item or you have a small garden and you're trying to sell some of your products, it may not be a requirement. But I would fully suggest uh, making sure you're going through the appropriate channels to uh, be a licensed business uh, just for your own you know, your own well-being because you don't want someone turning you in um, that you're not a legitimate business and making sales. And then it's a whole sales tax issue and all that fun stuff uh, through New York State. So as I said, it is a requirement to participate in our market. And I would assume any of the larger organized festivals or markets would require that same documentation. Oh, th that, that's what we found um, in, in our research. Um, and Chris, maybe you would talk a little bit about um, making those quarterly sales tax payments to the state. You know, how onerous is that process? Do you find it difficult? Um, did the SBDC help you? Uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yes, Robin has helped me a lot on this. Um, so now that they have it digitally, you can do it digitally. It makes it a little bit easier. I do it once a year and that's it. Um, we don't have a lot that we do with sales tax but my girls sell flowers at the market and cut flowers are taxed. So we have our sales tax ID number. And then I do once a year, send in our, our sales tax payments to the state. The first year, I think though, you have to do quarterly until the state says that you don't do enough sales that, or you do enough sales so that you can do it once a year. It doesn't, doesn't make sense to do if you've only done a couple hundred dollars in tax it doesn't make sense to do it every quarter and right. especially if you're seasonal. Right. It's a, a volume driven um, threshold that the state has. And I just like to say that if anyone has in-depth questions about how to pay sales tax, SBDC advisor can help you with that. Um, as Chris said, Robin, um, Kia, John, anyone, any of us can help you with that. So um, that's another uh, 
just another facet of things that we can do for small businesses. So also important to note that, uh, you know, like Kylie's market, a lot of the bigger markets will, you know, have those requirements um, because they're following the, the law um, and, you know, they're in, in line with the law. Um, if you're a craft, you know, provider, or a seller, uh, you don't have, and we'll cover this, I, I believe it's in the next slide, actually. Um, you don't need any um, permits or licenses, but you do need a valid um, New York State um, tax, sales tax permit. And the same is the case for fresh cut or dried flowers, um, wines on top of the, um, the permit from the liquor authority for wines. And you also, you know, if you're doing plant sales, you need a, a valid um, sales tax permit um, on top of the New York State Ag and Markets um, nursery dealer or um, what is it, grower's license. So I just wanted to chime in and, and put that out there too. Oh, absolutely. Um, yes, there's, you know, there's a lot of nuances to this. And that's why, you know, when Eric shared the website um, that Kylie also uses for guidance and that's a great resource. And if you have questions or if it's written in government ease and you can't, you know, and you need some help interpreting, just um, give us a call um, or give the Cornell Cooperative Extension Service a call. They can help you with those kind of questions as well. Uh, before we move on, I just want to kind of tie this back to the electronic payment systems also. Uh, I know Chris has mentioned um, in our previous meeting that when you're using a digital system like the Square to take payments, it really helps with your bookkeeping, which if you're filing for state taxes and all that stuff, um, having that down in a digital format can really be helpful when you're doing your reporting. Um, so you're not looking through your manually written books. Um, it's much more helpful because they'll report out all of that stuff. And you can set the systems up so it's just a touch of a button on what product it is. And if sales tax is required, it will separate that out. Um, so that's always helpful. And Kylie, also, if you're going to use Square and use it that way, you may want to set up a separate account for that to go in so it stays out of your personal account. And then that way you do not have to worry about anything. It's all right there in that one account. Um, okay, so thoughts and ideas from our panelists. What kind of agriculture or farmer's market permits are typically required by the state or county? Eric, since you're on my screen, I'm gonna throw this one at you first and have you, uh, have you talk. Sure. Um, so there's a variety of, uh, you know, permits and, you know, the scenarios where you would need those. Uh, it really heavily depends on which products you're, you're bringing to market. As I said before, um, you know, just so we cover the craft side of things, uh, you know, being from Cooperative Extension and my, my job title is um, ag, Agricultural Economic Development Specialist. So I'm more on the farm product side, but, but just so we do our fair share of covering crafts, there are no permits um, required, um, no licenses, just the, or, uh, there, are, there is the sales tax permit, but there's no licenses, there's no certificates required. And like Kylie mentioned before, you really wanna talk to your market manager or market coordinator um, when you're doing your research, um, just to make sure that you're in line with what the market requires on um, the farmer's market. Or, or if you're doing farm stand uh, marketing, talk with the farm stand operator. Um, uh, anyway, when it comes to fresh produce, no permits, uh, just following you know, whatever laws and regulations apply to fresh produce. Um, when it comes to plant sales, uh, if you're you know, engaged in the production of the plants, you're gonna need the Ag and Markets um, nursery growers license. If you're just selling and you're not engaged in production, you're gonna need the, the nursery dealers license from Ag and Markets. And you'll also need a valid state uh, sales tax certificate. Um, eggs don't require permits, um, but you do have to follow some safety guidelines with those. Um, maintaining them at 45 degrees or lower. Um, and the eggs must be farm owned. They can't be purchased. Um, when it comes to maple and honey, uh, you don't need permits if it's just the single ingredient product. But if you add ingredients, you need the um, Article 20C license. Uh, baked goods is, is where it gets a little interesting because some of this you know, falls under processing. Um, but if you're doing home-baked non-hazardous goods, which includes bread, 
that doesn't have any vegetables or fruits in it, uh, rolls, cookies, brownies, fudge, and double crust fruit pies, uh, you are exempt from any license that the license you would need would be the Article 20C. But if you are doing things that could be, you know, that are deemed hazardous or potentially hazardous, uh, such as those breads with fruits and vegetables or quick breads, then you'll need the, um, the Article 20C. And that's provided that you do 51% of your business uh, wholesale. Uh, all other baked goods must come from a New York State Department of Health facility. So that's a very important thing to, to know if you're dealing with baked goods, which are a pretty popular thing to try to sell at farmer's markets and farm stands. Right. Um, when you're doing drinks like cider, uh, wine, uh, for cider and fruit juice, Article 20C, um, for wines, you just need your sales tax certificate and you're gonna need your, um, your uh, permit from the liquor authority, your winery permit. And uh, microbreweries, the same thing. They'll need their permits or no fee permits from the liquor authority, New York State Liquor Authority. Um, processed foods, uh, a lot of that's covered in Article 20C licensing. There is that exemption that I mentioned before um, for, for things that aren't hazardous like jams, jellies, uh, candies that aren't chocolate, um, spices, herbs that are blended uh, or repackaged. Sorry, that's blending is a different issue. Uh, repackaged only um, and some snack items such as popcorn and uh, peanut butter, um, caramel. Um, other things like meats, that's a whole uh, other ball game where you have to abide by, as Kylie said before, you have to abide by the, um, the USDA regulations there for slaughtered and or processed. You also will require an Article 28D license if you're um, warehousing for wholesale. Um, and those products must be maintained at zero degrees Fahrenheit or below and sold frozen, according to this summary document that you can find on the, Federate, the Farm, Farmers Market Federation of New York site. And this information on this document is actually a much more digestible version of what some, there's a document you can find on the uh, New York State um, Ag and Markets website as well. And uh, we have a bunch of um, things we can drop in the chat for anybody interested in that. We'll pro probably at the end of the presentation. Um, same thing for chickens. You might have to, well, you'll, you'll have to um, get an Article 28 license for warehousing for wholesale, uh, Article 5A license um, if you're selling over 250 turkeys or over 1,000 birds. Um, no license are required um, for selling 250 or lower turkeys or 100, uh, 1,000 um, or lower uh, in birds. Well, that's, and, so, so yeah. that's really interesting how New York has really yeah. delineated some of the larger producers and try to make way for some of the smaller folks by adding all these specifics. And um, I do, I, yeah, and I do appreciate you mentioning the, the more digestible version because yes, we've reviewed them both and um, some of the actual state regs are a little dense, but um, the farm market is is um, definitely a little more understandable. So, um, so Chris, I see by your video here that you're in the greenhouse. So, how is the how has the um, permitting impacted your business? Do you find it did you find it onerous to get the permits that you needed, um, you know, in order to sell? Absolutely. Um if I didn't have the correct permits, I wouldn't be able to be at the Watertown market. I wouldn't have been able to be at a couple other markets that we used to do. Uh, we've done some smaller ones that didn't require it, but the more that I see how, I don't wanna say strict, but how, um, I guess it is strict, how strict the Watertown market is. It's all for the safety of the consumer, but also for the farmer. So you know that if I have a permit to sell the plants that I actually grew those plants from seed myself here in the greenhouse. And that's how a consumer would find out if they went to somebody, whether they actually grew that, um, grew that plant from start to finish, or if they went and bought it somewhere else and brought it in. Okay. And Kylie, if, if you have a new vendor or someone interested in the market, um, do, you know, do you typically answer some of these questions for them, you know, um, or do you expect people to come to you with full knowledge? 
but we're always open to answering any questions that people might have. Um, but there is some, you know, typically we get a business that's already established coming to participate in the market, but we have had new vendors that are coming into this completely blind and, you know, in order to, um, adequately serve our community, we have to be there to answer questions to the best of our ability too. And there's some things at the state level um, that we will make a phone call and do whatever we can to get answers um, to any questions there might be. For instance, we have a new vendor coming to the market this year that's doing uh, dog bones and treats. And that's a whole separate licensing and a whole other section of requirements. Um, if you're making dog food and dog treats. So we've been working with New York State uh, Ag and Markets to make sure they have everything that they need. Um, one other thing, I, because I think we're probably going to be moving on here, but another requirement um, that I think is worth mentioning is in order to participate in the farmer's market nutrition plan, you have to provide a crop plan uh, to us and to New York State um, to show that you are growing those products. So you can't just go and purchase them and resell them. Um, that it is certified by the state. Um, it is, you know, it's a legit thing and you do have to submit that plan ahead of time. Okay, so there's, I think, I think the lesson here is look at the regs, contact your resources, the SBDC, the Cornell Cooperative Extension Service, the, the manager of your farmer's market that you're interested in, in attending um, and participating in, and, and you know, do, do your homework. And they, we're all here to help you, but there's, you know, the, the full responsibility is on that business owner. That's, that's for sure. Um, okay, do I need to become a registered vendor at each local market or festival? This is Chris's question. She nailed this in our practice session. So I'm going to just give this to Chris and let her let the voice of experience talk for everybody. I'm assuming you're talking about when I told you we did four markets a week. Yeah. 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 So we, we used to do four markets a week. It was to get our name out there, to show people our product. Um, and it was, it was tough because we grow everything that we sell. Uh, so our gardens are large. We have eight acres of garden right now. And just at once, it was just the two of us, my husband and myself, we have now added to our family. So we have three children that, that help. Uh, but it, we did. We did register for four, four farmers markets. We slowly started dropping a market every year until we came to just one and our farm stand. Our our sales did not drop. Our sales actually went up. We put more time into each product. Our product looked better. Um, our gardens produced uh, tremendously because of it. So I would say it all depends on what you're gonna do for each market. If you're a crafter, you may you may have extra stuff built up in the, in the winter and you only do markets in the summer. So you would have products. If you're, if you're doing fruits and vegetables, you may want to consider at first starting out doing a few markets, but then slowing down because it will, your productivity will be better if you choose less, but you need to get your name out there. So you probably will have to do a few at first. So it's, it's all the balancing act and it's, it's everyone yes. has their own personal cost benefit analysis of, you know, how it works. And um, I just, when you told that story at our practice round and I just thought, isn't that the truth? You know, years ago, years ago um i i uh made some stuff and sold some craft at uh more at a holiday bazaars so that's how long ago it was when they used to have those anyway we had a person who was next to me who i became friendly with you know she had these beautiful pillows and they were in one color way and it was those were her two favorite colors and she got so frustrated and upset because uh, the stuff I was selling was more holiday wreaths and people were buying them. No one bought the pillows. So you have to do what the people want. You have to go where the people are and you have to make sure that you're not killing yourself to do something that, you know, I remember at the last market we did, she said, well, looks like I have 20 new pillows for my living room. So, you know, you have to, uh, you have to really understand what your market is. And if you're interested in, doing a study you look up and see what the markets are in your area go check them out see who's there see who's selling see who's not um and before we move on to our next slide um there was a quick question from courtney 
Um, and Eric, I'm going to ask you to answer this one. Jams, jellies, and pickled vegetables all are in Article 20C. Would that is that correct? Pickled vegetables in there as well. So yeah, as I noticed the question too. Oh, okay. I'm glad you. Uh, I'm glad you uh, um, brought us back to that really quickly. Uh, I will say that with the jams and jellies, they're exempt from Article 20C, and you know, I, I'm not an ag and markets guy, so definitely do your homework before you get into any of this stuff. But just based on what I, you know, my research and what I know, um, that you, you'll be exempt doing jams and jellies, but when it comes to canned fruits and vegetables, they're not permitted. And uh, you would need a 20C license and uh, you would need to um, be registered with the federal government as a um, food processor. So I don't know if pickled vegetables would in be included in canned vegetables. Um, you know, that would be something you would want to reach out to Ag and Markets just to clarify. But, um, you know, I hope that helps just to give you an initial understanding. Okay. All right. Thank you, Eric. Do I need liability insurance for my farm stand? Kylie, would you start off with this one as the as the professional farm market manager that you are? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I can't speak specifically to the farm stands, although I would uh, probably suggest you get liability coverage um, for that as well. But at our farm and craft market, we do require all of our vendors to have uh, liability insurance. Um, and it really is to protect our customers. Um, and it is to protect your business. You never know uh, what might happen. Someone could trip in your booth space. And unfortunately, it's 2021. And uh, there are individuals that will take it upon themselves to try and get some money for that. Uh, we have had to utilize uh, liability insurance over the years at our market. Um, so I would highly suggest uh, just to cover your business. I mean, there could be a situation if you're serving food um, and someone falls ill after eating a food at your booth, uh, you know, who knows what could happen. Um, so it's certainly there to protect your business um, and the customers that are coming to visit. Kylie, not only, not only for um, personal liability, like for somebody getting hurt, but an example of the market it's always windy where we are set up for Watertown and we lost three tents, three tents are $200 each. So our insurance covered those tents when that windstorm came up and blew them away. And it doesn't matter how you've got them tied down when, when they come in through that wind comes through and you're unexpected, they're going and there's nothing you can do. But being right there on that road as well, those tents could have very well gone into the road and hit someone's vehicle could have caused any kind of damage. Thankfully, it was only to the tents that we had damage. But uh, at our farm stand, it's the same way. We live on a main road. Our fam farm stand is on a main road. We have liability insurance. Anything can happen. We just don't know. Sure. Right. It's, yeah, it's just common sense. Go ahead, Eric. Um, you know, even for craft vendors, they might want to consider it. You know, and a lot of um, farmers will already have like a farm liability insurance plan. Uh, most markets will, you know, especially like the bigger, you know, well-established markets, farmers markets will will require liability insurance, just like Kylie was saying, they sh her market requires it. So it's, you know, and it, it goes back to the previous question too, of if you have to be at every one, you know, that's just one of the many barriers that you could experience when you get into this. There's insurance, um, there's all the permits, there's the time, which is why you pro you might not want to be going to all the markets and participating. There's the that the, typically with farm stands and um, farmers markets, there there's many benefits, and one of them is low startup costs. But you still do have to have your tables and your weights to prevent those things from happening. And even if you get all that stuff and you you know you don't have liability insurance, you could end up in a more serious situation. So. That's absolutely true. And as we all know, you can't count on the weather as I'm looking at the snow out my window. And I know all of you are too. So um, that's, and you know, that's the advice from the SBDC is always get the insurance, buy the insurance, get the, get the coverage. Um, and you, you know, you won't, you won't regret it. What are a few best practices for running a farm stand? Chris, I'm going to let you start off with this because you are actually running a farm stand. Uh, I would say the most important thing is to have fresh produce out there. Check it regularly. Ours is outdoors. It's undercover, 
but the heat can really kill like lettuce. Um, so once you cut your lettuce, your spinach, we try to keep it in a cooler under or over ice. So that way it stays cool. Um, just things that should be refrigerated um, should be on ice or at least in, a, in maybe a small refrigerator. We try to keep it as fresh as possible. Uh, usually checking it, like I said, two or three times a day, sometimes even more. And make sure you have the product. If somebody's coming, we're not we're not right in town. So if someone's coming from four miles away, five miles away, and we don't have it there, and we're ours is again um, honor system, and we're not there to help that person, then what's the chances they're going to take a, a chance again and come out and, and check your stand? Things aren't okay. fresh. Okay. So really, how would you want to be treated as a customer? That's how you want to treat your customers. Okay. Absolutely. Kylie, do you have any um, thoughts as the as the market manager? You know, you want to make sure you're providing signage. What you have available, what payment options you have available to the customers, I think is really great. Uh, if, you know, like Chris, for instance, is sharing that, she's offering five or six different payment options. If someone doesn't know, you can accept Facebook payment and it's on there either at your uh, your market stand or your farm stand or at the market itself. Um, it's really great to make sure your customers know that there are uh, a number of available options other than just cash uh, because nowadays um, finding someone who's, pay who's paying with cash um, is certainly not as prevalent as it used to be. Um, additional signage, if you have something unique at your stand, um, you know, we were talking before um, in our trial run about uh, garlic scapes, I think. Uh, yeah. If you have those, it's not something that's overly popular. Have that out. Uh, have some signage highlighting those unique products that you can get at your stand, I think, is always really helpful. Um, and and certainly make sure and recipes, and recipes. Yeah, yeah, that's huge. That would be if you're at a farmer's market or if you have them available at your stand, even if you have a printed version on the wall in your farm stand that you can encourage people to take a picture of, um, you know, for those types of things would be really helpful. And um, using social media certainly helps in attracting a new client base um, or just communicating with your current customers and letting them know what your specials are that week or what if you're bringing something new or if you're restocked in a certain area. And Chris, I think um, last year and previous years actually um, used social media to bring in orders and then you can just quickly stop in at a certain time and pick up your, your whole collection of vegetables and quickly be on your way if you don't have time to peruse the entire market. Um, so I think that's certainly a good option uh, that COVID-19 really kind of spearheaded um, for those that weren't using social media for that. It was encouraged um, by the Farmers Market Federation last year actually to try and do uh, pre-orders through social media or the phone or however you would communicate with your customer to get an order in place and make sure people weren't lingering because last year was a little bit different this year i think we're going to have a little bit more of a, a community event experience um, than we were able to have last year okay. and yeah. uh, discounts and coupons always are you know encourage people to take advantage of those um everyone loves a good discount that's right even if it's buy one get one free um on a squash or something like that you know that's always um you know that people love that those are all good points. You know, um, when it comes to the signage too, you can, if there's room for it, or you know, if it, it's possible, you can communicate that with your signage, or even with your interactions with customers. Just you know, your face-to-face, -face, um, or you know, if you're doing online sales, what you're doing to make your products safer in the in the pandemic setting. And you know, even with normal times, you can use your signage to communicate any certifications you have like new york grown and certified uh, gap certified if you're certified organic um, those things are becoming more and more important to consumers so you might end up driving up your sales by communicating those that's a that's a great point eric people do look now for organic or pesticide free or what have you and the whole point about coordinating your 
in-person presence with your online presence and making sure that if you're saying online, you, you have strawberries today. Um, if you run out at 10 a.m., um, you better let everybody know that. So those are, these are all great points. I want to just go back one second. There was a question about what liability limits that we recommend for insurance. And um, I see one of our other participants answered it, and I could not have answered it better. Um, really contact your insurance agent. That wouldn't be, we can tell you what the recommended minimums are, but the, your insurance agent will know much better than the SBDC or um, you know, the manager of a, of a farm or craft market that you want to attend. So give your own insurance agent a call and have a frank conversation with them. That's our, that's our best advice. So really quick on that liability piece, and I definitely encourage you to, you know, speak with your insurance agent, but our market requires a certain, um, a certain amount of insurance coverage and it's 2 million aggregate. I forget what it is specifically, and I should know it off the top of my head and I don't, um, it is in our application, but we have a minimum uh, requirement, but there are a lot, uh, you know, if you own a, a farm, you have higher than uh, those requirements typically anyway, but certainly uh, speak with the insurance agent for sure, but make sure and see if your market has specific requirements um, to participate. Right, it all depends on where you sell. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and you know, Kylie made a good point to me, I don't think it was even in our practice run, but we were talking about who sells at these things and just this is just I thought it was interesting information. You'll see the Amish selling at some markets and not others. Um, and one of the reasons is because they will not carry liability insurance. So uh, a, a market like the Watertown Farm and Craft Market doesn't have Amish vendors for that reason. Um, some of the other markets don't have them for that reason, and also because they don't certify their kitchens. So you know um, that's just I just thought that was interesting. And um, so if you ever are wondering that, now you know. How do I become a farmer's co-op partner? This was a, an interesting question. Um, and I, you know, with the co-ops being a business structure, it's kind of hard to understand exactly, you know, how you would be a partner. If you're a farmer, you could join a co-op and do your business that way. Um, Co-ops are usually organized around a commodity, like a specific commodity and, and they, uh, they with that in mind, they have certain values. They operate very democratically. If you're a craft vendor, I don't know how you would get involved with farmers co-ops, but if you're a farm pro you know, product producer, uh, then you could definitely work with co-ops. Um, I would just research what's out there in your area. And, and I really appreciate you, you keep bringing up the crafters. And we went back and forth about whether to have a crafter with us or not. And we decided to focus more on the farm piece for this, but um, I, you know, for everything we're saying, it's true if you're a crafter and probably less requirements. So just keep that oh, in mind. Sure. Yeah, crafters have it much easier. Um, I did want to mention, though, um, since our practice run, a couple thoughts came to mind. You know, most likely, if you're a crafter, you're dealing with, you know, your the, the things that you're using to produce your crafts are, are going to be like already taken care of on the permit side, you know, like fabrics and woods. But if you're out there gathering materials from land, you do have to be careful. Like if you're, you're getting your wood on your own property or, you know, on, make sure it's legal and uh, definitely make sure you're not dealing with any protected species because you'll fall under BEC requirements, um, at, you know, but if, like I said, if you're getting you know, like fabric and, and already you know, processed wood, that wouldn't be your responsibility. So if there was any issue with that product, it would go to the manufacturers of those. But okay. I did want to make sure that we covered some craft stuff because I figured, you know, people will be on the call. I, I can't really speak a lot about crafters, but. That's no, no, I think you've done a great job keeping us, um, keeping that in our minds. And sure. You know, one of the things that we see, and I'm sure everybody sees this, is you see people using driftwood, for example. So where did you get the driftwood? And, you know, are you aging it in your own kiln? Uh, you know, are you taking sticks from your own property and, and aging it or, you know, distressing it somehow? Or are you picking it up from a state park? There's a big difference. And so, and it's, the answers are easily available. So let's see. Oh, current safety guidelines. Um, 
We are in the age of COVID. I think we've talked a bit about this, but um, I think Kylie, you were going to talk about sampling um, at market. Yeah. Yeah, I can speak to that. So New York State Ag and Markets haven't put out updated guidance for farmers markets since August of 2020. Uh, so we still are required to follow the guidelines that were set last August. Um, and one of those things included in there is the sampling of products at market. So you can have a dedicated sampling area uh, where people are required to be seated and you have to maintain the seating area and go in and clean the space and all of that good stuff. Or you can have samples available uh, in like little Dixie cups um, to be consumed off premise. So, you know, we, you can't be encouraging people to do samples directly at your booth, but you can have them take it away sample it when they're out of the market and come back. Um, it's a little challenging, I understand, but unfortunately, we have to follow the guidelines that are put on us uh, by New York State. Um, our farm and craft market, because we are located on state property in front of the Dulles State Office building, we have to submit a multi-page safety plan to the state that has to be approved in order to have our market. And we do have to address the sampling piece in that. Um, so it's not just because we're trying to be pains in the butt. Um, we have New York State uh, reviewing our plan and are aware of what we are submitting. So it's just something to keep in mind. But they did allow last year that you could do a little kind of takeaway uh, sampling uh, structure, which is helpful. Well, you know, when you think about years past when there were just jars of mayonnaise out, or not mayonnaise, but mustards out and people would spread them on their own cracker. Yeah, those days are gone forever, I'm afraid, or at least for the foreseeable future. So. I'm really glad that Kylie brought up the, the New York State Business Safety Plan. And I was actually wondering, um, you know, based on Kylie's experience, what, you know, because she operates like a really, you know, well-established market that, you know, has like really good requirements of the vendors. Um, I'm, I was wondering, it, from your end, are you looking at your farmer mark vendors uh, business plans because they are required, but they're not go like unless there's a situation that happens where they you know then you would have the Department of Health tracking and and all that. You're you're not really re required to present them or sub well, re really you're re you're not required to submit them to uh, to the government. You just ha have to have them. And I was wondering if That's you're a, a farmer vendor, do you have to submit those to the market coordinator or market? Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and that's something that I failed to, to bring up, but we are, um, we are collecting safety plans. Uh, we did last year also from every vendor in our market, not just um, the food vendors, but the crafters as well. And that's, that's additional guidance um, set forth by New York State. So every single business in New York State has to have a, a safety plan in place. Again, you don't have to um, submit it to anything, but you just have to have it on site. And we like to have a copy with us as well in the event that someone came in and did an inspection or if someone, you know, unfortunately decided that they didn't think you were following the guidance as you're supposed to be, if you have that safety plan in place and available uh, to be reviewed and inspected by whoever might come from the state, um, again, it's really just covering yourself as a business owner. Um, so thanks for bringing that up, Eric. That's, oh, that's a huge point that yeah. Um, yeah, even for the isn't crafters. always at the top of my mind. Yeah, absolutely. And for more information on, on those uh, business safety plans that are required, um, that's all on the uh, New York State government website, not even Department of Agriculture. You can go onto like I, one of their business sides of things. Uh, I, I don't have those links available right now, but um, we have those on our website. Um, that's cooperativeextension.org. Um, so you could, that's like yeah. for us, we go county. Um, I'm sure you can find them all over the place. They're pretty easy to find if you did a Google search you could really easily find the you know, templates that you can use to create a business safety plan. Because, you know, as that first survey question um, kind of showed us, we have a lot of people considering starting up a business or in their, they're in the midst of starting up a business. And you're definitely going to want to write that safety plan. I know it's time consuming. Um, and, you know, you're think, you might think like, oh, I don't need to submit it to the government. But just like liability insurance, you're going to want to have your bases covered because if something happens, you do not want to have to deal with the fallout from that. 
Yeah, right. and New York State has done a pretty good job of uh, providing that template, like you mentioned, and I believe that's on the New York Forward. So I think it's ny.forward.gov. Yes, thank you. Um, and it's it's broken down by industry, um, and some some industries you have to, you know, accept the guidance and submit it to the state. But I I believe that this is just you have to have the plan typed up or written up and in place um, without having to submit it to anybody. Yep, it's just it's just in your back pocket in case someone asks you to see it. So, um, kind of like your driver's license. Well, it makes you think. You know, it's it's helpful because it makes you think about how you're going to make sure your business or your stand is safe for your customers, um, whether they're you know, whether you're a food vendor or a crafter. Um, just being mindful of um, you know how you're making sure you're following that guidance that's in place. Absolutely, absolutely. 2021 outlook for local farmers market. Chris, will you start will you start us off on this one? I only see it getting better than last year. I mean, things are loosening up. Um, the, the vaccines out. Some people have gotten the vaccine. They feel a little safer. Last year at the beginning of this, um, there were less customers walking through the farmers market although there were more customers at our farm stand. So I think it was all, um, people were scared. And I think as time went by, things got a little bit, uh, the virus got a little bit less. Um, people aren't as worried anymore. There's a vaccine, they feel safe. I see it getting better this year. I actually, I hope it gets better, but I, I see it getting better. People are tired. They don't want to stay home anymore. We, we saw the same thing in our county, uh, a, a huge, boom in the interest of local food and uh, trying to procure it because of what was going on with the grocery stores yes. and uh, prices, you know, going through the roof or availability of products just totally diminishing overnight. Um, and, you know, agritourism was a great way for people to get out of their house. It was one of the few things they were really allowed to do because of all the businesses you know, being closed with the shutdown, the lockdown. So you're, you're going to see more of that this year and hopefully in the you know next couple years this renewed interest in food and this renewed interest in going out and meeting your farmer at farmers farm stands but yeah it's you know, definitely looking good and you touched on the the grocery issue and i think people are more i think we saw it towards the end of the season where we couldn't find canning jars yeah. um i think people are are going to start doing that again, start canning, start having their own food available in case of things like this. Sure. And so you might see more vendors like the, you know, attendees on this call, the you know, potential vendors, but you also might see people that would just want to get stuff from their, you know, their neighbors that are making this stuff. You know, they, they, they know these people and they, they can build their relationships. Um, you know, when you're getting, you know, the same, you know, multinational company brand of whatever, and there's no faces, really supporting a local economy by doing that you know there's something lost there and people are connecting on a different level now because of the pandemic so yeah i i agree with all of those things especially the connection um you know it's you can talk to the vendors you can ask them questions about the product how to cook it chris uh had a great example um in, the, in our pre uh webinar meeting of you know she'll share recipes of unique vegetable options that people are afraid of because they have no idea how to cook it or eat it or what it tastes like or anything and you know not everyone loves vegetables but if you can make it fun and creative um and the vendors can share examples and stories um that's that's really important and one thing that i wanted to add quickly um kind of in the prediction of it being a busy market season one thing specifically for our market uh we are located in downtown watertown on washington street kind of in the business district of the city and last year people were working from home uh, I think the capacity in the state office building was at 10%. So the, the people were not uh, working in the state office building. And although capacity is not up to 100%, I know of several businesses that are now back in the office more regularly. Um, a lot are going back full time starting uh, in mid-May or early June. Uh, so I think that alone will bring out a much larger crowd uh, to our market this year, which is really exciting. Well, before we give final thoughts, we did have a, qu a question. Um, this is our last 
question, I think. Um, and I'll, I'll read it for our, for our panelists. I'm wondering if anyone has any tips on how to communicate why my products are worth the higher price than mass produced items. This is the hardest part of my business. Anybody want to take a stab at that? How do you, you know, how, Chris, how do you do it? How I will, do you I'll take a stab because a lot of people say our produce is priced higher, but a lot of people don't know the process. Um, and that's why we, we take the time to talk. If somebody asks us or even says to us, you know, and they do, wow, you're higher than so-and-so down the street. Here's why. Everything costs money. So it costs me to be at market. It costs for the tents that we have. It costs for the insurance. So I'm not a big company. I don't have all that revenue. So everything that I make from the gardens, a lot of it's going back into this. But I do bring my surplus here to the market. But I have to at least make something in order to be where I'm at right now. Uh, we, a lot of people don't know that we have an actual vegetable washer. So that washer costs money. Heat has gone up this year. So our heating the greenhouses right now, I'm heating them. It's snowing outside, but I still have to grow these vegetables so I can put them in the ground and bring them to market. So all of this costs money to run the tractors and people don't think of it like that. They think you're a farmer, you have some veggies here, you just had a backyard garden. We have eight acres, we, we can't do it all by hand. So it does get it expensive. And we ask people to come out and, and tour our place. Come on out, you know, see what we've got. Let me show you why it costs so much. And we have no issues giving tours of the farm and people have a better understanding that way. So, so it's really, it's a matter of education and communication. And Absolutely. You, you, right. So you have to let them know what, what all goes into your products and what, and what are the, you know, what are the features and benefits? I mean, that's a sort of a marketing term that, you know, exactly. you typically use for hardware, but what are the features and benefits of your tomatoes over a tomato from Tops? Well, right. No you know, fertilization. I'm not putting anything. When we put it in the ground, it's there and that's how it grows. But we have to walk through and pick all the weeds by hand around those and our, again eight, eight acres my time has got to be worth something that's right. <laughs> I that's, would right. Hope. that's right um eric or kylie do you have any any thoughts on that final question which i think is a really good one how you know how do you differentiate between a mass-produced apron that you could say buy at target and a handmade apron that is made by a crafter who sells them at the watertown craft market yeah, I do have some thoughts on that. Like uh, this goes back to best practices. As Chris was saying, it's how you communicate with your customers. Um, I don't know if it was touched on. I was uh, sorry I didn't chime in when we were talking about best practices. I was trying to get the links in the chat box, but um, customer service is a huge thing, and you know, it's a huge part of it, uh, and the message that you're delivering to your customers. But it also is where you're selling it. So if you've had an issue with this, you might need to try out other markets because the demographic of the customer base might not be working for your product. I don't know if the, the person that posed this question is talking about a craft product or a, a farm product, but I think it, you know there's still things that apply to both. And you definitely wanna do your research, um, be mindful of the barriers that you can you know, encounter and try to prepare for those so that you don't end up wasting much of your time, uh, especially if you're doing farm products and you need to be on your farm. But even for craft vendors, they need to take the time to make their crafts at home and then bring them to market. If they're spending all their time at markets, you're not gonna have as much of a supply. And if you, if you, you know, get really lucky, you, you strike it and you get like a, a market that you're selling products at, you still need to make more. So. You have to find a nice balance and it's a lot of trial and error, but there's a huge amount of benefits to participating in uh, farmers markets and at farm stands. You know, you have like an already established customer base. Uh, you just need to research it because, you know, via the different markets and, you know, there's other benefits um, like the higher margins, which is what, what the question is about. Uh, you can talk, I mean, <laughs> It's unfortunate how political things get these days, but you know some of the stuff that you're buying at Target's not coming from anywhere in the country. It's coming from outside of the country. So talk about you know this was made by me, and you're supporting you know your community and by buying. Um, there's plenty of things you can use in your messaging. And even when they say I can get it cheaper at Walmart or Tops, and maybe it is local, 
but that farmer is selling bulk to those stores. I'm not selling bulk to a single customer. So it's hard, you know, what do you say? Maybe I, I'll use a tomato, for example. Maybe you can get a tomato for 50 cents at um, Tops, and my tomato might be a dollar. So what's the difference? Well, Tops ordered thousands of tomatoes, so it makes it worth selling all of those to them. But it's hard for me to do, if I had to sell it for 50 cents at the market, I'm not paying my rent at the market. Now I've got to add on top of that the insurance. And that's why, like you said, customer service, you got to talk to them, you got to explain to them, educate them that there's a big difference between a small market and a very large store. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's all about where you're selling it and who you're selling it to. Yep, and, and Chris is talking about, we had a question that came in that said, you know, and the person made a, a valid point, which is that tops maybe not is maybe not be the best example. Of course, that's what I said right off the off the top of my head, no pun intended. Because in the fall, they do have a lot of local products, and it is great to be able to go to tops and buy New York State apples. We're all year round. We're very lucky that we don't have just bland Granny Smiths from the Pacific Northwest, like a lot of places do. Right? We have I have empires. And um, another one that uh, is my husband's favorite in my fridge right now. So, you know, that that is true. Um, but even though some of the products and tops are local, you're not meeting the farmer. You're not seeing who exactly. grew this for you or who crafted this for you. And so it's, you know. And how fresh is that? Did he go out and pick it that day and right. bring it to the store? And so, I think, yeah, there's Great there's point. differences between us. And, and, and we're very lucky to have New York-based supermarket chains. Again, a lot of places aren't that lucky. Um, and I'm always impressed about by the local products that I can find at Tops. However, try and find real cider at Tops. You're only going to find pasteurized cider. You're not going to find the UV light done. So, you know, so think about really it is the features and benefits of your individual creation of your products that really make the difference. I wanna thank Chris, Eric, and Kylie so much for helping us out today. It's been great to have you guys. And anybody who's listening, thank you for attending and let us know what other topics you want.